So uh, Prescott Audubon Society, thank you very much for having me here. Um, as Eric uh, introduced, my name is Joe Trudeau, Conservation Director with Save the Dells. And I'm real excited tonight to be speaking to you. And the topic is, um, is uh, broad and deep, the crossroads of science, politics, advocacy, and real estate. And it's funny because I submitted this talk title, you know, what, like three months ago or something. And then did anyone see Walt Anderson's talk at Natural History Institute about like six or eight weeks ago? It was like almost the same topic because he was talking about how conservation is sort of integrated into, into art and natural history. And, and there's this, um, there's this, this uh, multifaceted uh, web that, uh, that is the fundamental nature of conservation work that it incorporates so many aspects of professional and personal and artistic life. So um, let's just review uh, Save the Dells mission. I think a lot of you are familiar with Save the Dells. Is there anyone who isn't? Wow, that's pretty good. So let's just cut to the last slide. No. Um, <laughs> so, so our big picture mission, and this is something that doesn't necessarily get realized all the time, is to permanently preserve the remaining undeveloped portions of the Granite Dells as part of a publicly accessible Granite Dells Regional Park and Preserve. And for a while, it was just Granite Dells Regional Park. And so if you have one of our maps or you've been to our talks before, Regional Park. But we actually got criticized quite a bit by um, people within the city of Prescott for suggesting that we wanted to have swing sets and swimming pools and ball fields out in the Dells. And, um, and so they misinterpreted what a park was. Evidently, they'd never been to like Grand Canyon National Park, which is predominantly a natural environment. So, um, so uh, to, 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 uh, to shed off that criticism, we added preserve too. And that also, I think, is authentic in that it speaks to a lot of our, um, our concerns in this group for preserving wildlife habitat and preserving quiet spaces for quiet passive recreation. I want to take this moment to thank some key people, uh, my fellow committee members, a few who are here tonight, uh, our many dedicated volunteers. I see some of our volunteers here tonight, um, our many supporters, just folks across the community, our generous donors, our very, very attentive politicians in Prescott who will make the right decision in the end, and our photographers who have given uh, generously of their photos, mainly Walt Anderson, M Matt Turner, Mike Coffey, and Mark Strickland. Um, so their photos are used throughout here, as well as some of my photos, too. So my main objectives for the night are, um, first and foremost, to understand what the regional park and preserve could be and where Arizona eco-development's land fits into it. One of the common misperceptions is that Arizona eco-development in the 500 acres that we want to protect there, a misperception is that is the regional park. No. That constitutes about a tenth of what the regional park could be. So I want to make sure we understand the distinction between the regional park and preserve and Arizona Eco Development's 500 acres. Um, I want everyone to understand why we organize as a political action committee or a PAC, not as a 501c3, and what advantages that uh, gave us. Um, Understand what's next in our mission to save the Dells, because this is a dynamic and constantly uh, changing uh, and ad adaptive process and how you can take action. And then all of this sort of leads up to the fourth uh, objective is to prepare you to be a good ambassador in the community. We would not have gotten to where we are right now had uh, a number of people not engaged and really took the time to understand what we're trying to do and to go talk to your neighbors and friends and coworkers and write letters to the city, et cetera. So we want to prepare you to be a good ambassador. So um, you're probably wondering why we're looking at that. Uh, is that Arizona? No. no. Um, that's, a, that's a sphagnum bog. And so I, I want to just explain my personal connection to the Audubon Society because uh, I have a lifelong connection with the Audubon. So this is the Panema Bog Wildlife Sanctuary. Has anyone ever heard of that? So, okay. So Panema Bog is uh, a, a New Hampshire Audubon Society preserve in New Hampshire. And my family donated this land to the Audubon Society in 1979. It's a 75-acre preserve. It's a, um, it's a kettle pond, so it's a remnant of the, uh, the Pleistocene glaciation. And it's a sphagnum mat. So you go out on that mat of vegetation, and you can start bouncing and bouncing. And then before you know it, 100 feet in every direction of you, the entire ground is bouncing. Because you're, you're on like about two or three feet of peat moss, 
that is overlying maybe 100 feet of just like anaerobically decomposing sludge. These are extremely acidic environments where nothing decomposes, it just accumulates. And uh, there, it's an incredible en environment of, uh, of acid tolerant plants, interesting things like the carnivorous pitcher plant, uh, blueberries of several different uh, varieties, and then uh, gradiating up into a, a dry upland forest uh, with a mixture of anything from uh, Appalachian, uh, Southern Appalachian oak species to black spruce, which can grow all the way to the Arctic Circle. So these peat bog environments are these incredible um, melting pots of southern and northern vegetative communities and the wildlife that use, use them. So, uh, so this is Audubon Society Preserve. So in this photo, this is an aerial photo from Google Earth, you're looking at the uh, Panema Bog Wildlife Sanctuary. It's this green polygon right here. There's the pond, um, which every year the pond gets a little bit smaller because the sphagnum moss grows in closer. And within my lifetime, the pond will probably disappear. That yellow circle is my house. That's where I grew up. And when I was a little boy, almost none of the other houses existed. And so Southern New Hampshire is a rapidly uh, suburbanizing place, becoming a bedroom community to Boston. And I contributed to that. So that's the neighborhood that my family built. So my grandfather owned all that land, and he and my father and myself uh, developed that small neighborhood of about 40 homes. But take note, that for every acre we built on, we protected with the Audubon Society. And that is something, little did I know then, would really influence my understanding of land use, here we are 40 years later. That if you're going to impact the environment, do something to mitigate it. And so that's at the core of our argument with the city council and with Arizona Eco Development, is they're going to have a hugely impactful development and it must be mitigated accordingly. The 500 acres that we are advocating for the protection of is a fair, in our, our vision, a fair mitigation for the net or the, the ex extensive development that that uh, development will be. So from an early age, I was taught about balance, offset, mitigation, and having some degree of uh, appreciation for a natural environment as part of a development. And from all, you know, from those, that neighborhood, there's nice little trails that go out there and the Audubon Society maintains the boardwalk and it's really a wonderful place. But we're not here to talk about New Hampshire. So uh, while, while uh, Russ is, is messing with this, I'll share some extremely troubling news. Uh, yesterday, um, so uh, as uh, Eric mentioned, I work with the Center for Biological Diversity. Yesterday, one of my colleagues was going through the uh, Federal Register, which is where all federal actions are posted. And um, a uh, major pumped storage developer from Phoenix has put in a proposal with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to build two dams in the Grand Canyon. Not a joke. Yeah, and this is a very grave threat considering um, the uh, direction that the federal government is going with land preservation these days. Uh, so a pump storage project, as there's one um, uh, that is proposed for uh, up in the uh, Big Chino Valley, which would uh, drain about 28,000 acre feet of water out of uh, the Big Chino Aquifer, which is the source of the Verde River. Uh, these are projects where they pump water from a uh, lower reservoir to an upper one, and then it flows down through turbines to create electricity. And so they want to build one in the Little Colorado River, which comes into the Grand Canyon at the uh, confluence of the Colorado and Little Colorado. And um, does this work now? Nothing, huh? How uncouth. Chalk it up to some solar waves or something. Oh, we have a question in the front row, Dr. Rusing. So, so Tom wants to know, is damming the Grand Canyon and the Little Colorado River even a possibility? Well, um, yeah, it is. Anything is possible. Um, we are rap rapidly seeing our bedrock environmental laws rolled back and dismantled. And um, so it's a possibility for sure. And the dam proposal, uh, the dams, it's actually on the Navajo Nation. So it could be um, 
Uh, it, it may not be subject to all of the typical environmental uh, rules that, uh, that it, it were it in the national park or national forest land. So it's, it's a very grave, serious threat. Uh, we have to take it seriously. Um, I think from a practical level, it'd be extremely difficult to actually pull the project off. You know, it's hard enough to, to like do trail work in the Grand Canyon, let alone build a dam in it. Um, so there may be technical uh, barriers, but uh, it really speaks to the, um, uh, the threat that a lot of our national tre treasures are facing. You know, there's uh, so much uh, interest in plundering our, our shared resources in the environment, and people will never rest on that, and so we need to be eternally vigilant. Question? Yes. Wouldn't the Navajo and Hopi tribes have a say? Absolutely. The Navajo might even be proponents of it, for all we know. Um, uh, the um, the uh, tram project to the confluence, is anyone familiar with the tramway that was proposed? That was a huge uh, fight within the Navajo Nation. There were a lot of people in the tribe and with tribal government who supported that because it's economic development. Um, ultimately, that proposal was beat back. Um, the Hopi tribe uh, will fight this thing tooth and nail because it would flood their most sacred site, their point of origin called the Sipapu, and it would also flood their uh, salt mines where they've been going to harvest salt for thousands of years. And so the Hopi will be very active in this. Oh, so it's, there's, the question is, are there two sites? No, there's one site, but a pumped storage project requires two reservoirs, a lower reservoir and an upper reservoir. The water drains from the upper one to the lower one through turbines and creates electricity. And then at night, or, or at day, can't get that straight, but whenever the electricity is cheapest, they actually buy electricity back from the grid to pump it back up to the top. So they're kind of a boondoggle. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense and it destroys a whole lot of environment in the, in the process. Cool, I'll get to that later, Roy. All right, this is gonna be a hit show on, on uh, Prescott, Prescott Media Center, yeah. <laughs> All right, so I've used half my time. I'm gonna have to talk real fast now, so let's keep going. Um, so, but hey, we talked about New Hampshire, we're back in action, we're here to talk about the Granite Dells. Uh, boom, that is beautiful, that's what we're trying to save. Um, so. Key question is who is Save the Dells? People still ask us that. Uh, it's not just me. Um, we were formed in 2016. I convened a meeting with a bunch of, uh, or a, a half a dozen really important people who've been involved in open space for a long time. And uh, that was, uh, you know, three and a half years ago almost. Uh, we went public in January 2018. So that first year and a half, we just spent our time getting organized, understanding uh, what our scope of our work would be. Um, and together, we today, Save the Dells, continuing a decades-long fight to protect open space in Prescott. It's not just me, though. The key thing about this picture is the other people, because we would not have been successful if it was just me and Amber and Walt Anderson and Tom and Roy beating our chests, you know? Um, take note of this woman right here. That's Paula Burr. If you get our e-newsletters, uh, you just were introduced to her. Paula is our new vice chair. So she is technically second in command behind Amber, our chairman. So, um, so this, this is a picture from the open house. Was anyone there or when 400 people showed up to City Hall? A few of you. All right, we can get some more of you out next time. Yeah. So we are the greater community of Prescott. I think that's the bottom line. Save the Dells is not just a committee. It's really become a Prescott movement. You know, it's a lot of people who are... Uh, open space advocates, wildlife advocates, or just uh, disgruntled and upset with the way the government works here in Prescott. Um, this is our event at Yavapai College last summer, where well over a thousand people turned out, a really great event. I'm not gonna say everyone there was a supporter. I think some people probably were not. Uh, but the majority of those people were there uh, to learn more and support the cause. You know, we do things that I never thought I would ever do, like be in a parade. I'm not a parade goer. I'm not very festive with, you know, parade activities. Um, Fourth of July, I think, is can be a very uh, obnoxious holiday. Um, <laughs> but alas, you know, 
you know, we get together and do the 4th of July parade. And it's true. Conservation is an American tradition. We can go all the way back to Massachusetts in the 1600s, where after a few years, they realized they'd killed most of the deer and they had to conserve their natural resources and think about uh, a harvest rate that was uh, sustainable. And so it goes all the way back in American history. Uh, other parades, this is such a great picture. We went to Scottsdale and marched in the Parada del Sol where many thousands of people show up. And take note of the folks in the back on horseback. You know, Save the Dells is not just, um, as, as some people have characterized us, uh, we're not just a bunch of um, whiny liberal environmentalists. Um, we have people who are like cowboy horse riders who want to preserve Western heritage and preserve the Peavine Trail to go ride the horses on. This is a uh, nonpartisan, broad-based community endeavor that attracts a lot of people. Um, here's a letter to the editor. Raise your hand if you've written a letter to the editor. Pretty good. About a quarter of the room. I think there's some work to do there. Um, this is a really nice letter. It's real concise. I've lived in Prescott for 13 years. I'm horrified what the city council would entertain the idea of developers destroying a natural wonder. Uh, people are moving here in droves, but why do they need housing so close to the trails? And I end, I urge the Prescott City Council to preserve the 500 acres that we are requesting. I don't know who Janet Ritter is. Do any of you? Okay, a couple of you do. Well, hats off to Janet Ritter. We're really proud that we started this movement where in the beginning, it was committee members writing letters to the editor in an orchestrated fashion but we sowed the seeds for a community movement where now letters are very frequent in the paper. This character here, Tim Anderson, I don't know him, but he says in here, I've lived in this community for over 20 years and never heard a topic raised so consistently and passionately. And sure enough, you know, without, uh, without a doubt, every week there's one or two and sometimes, you know, three or four letters about the Dells. And now it's a little different. It's kind of morphed into the city council thing with Kathy or city water policy or just general discontent with growth. But I, I feel like our activities have really engaged the public and created a space where people are feeling feisty and want to say something. And that's what it takes to run a democracy effectively is when the people are speaking up. Who saved the Dells? People like this, I don't even know whose house that is, but they get one of our signs. And if you want one of our signs, you can have one too. If you just email savethedells at gmail.com and say, hey, I want one of your yard signs, we'll figure out a way to get one to you. But we see these all over town and it's great. We've got several different designs and it's really great whenever we're cruising around and you see a house, I don't know who lives there, but they're supporting the cause and that feels great. We got businesses supporting us. This is the, the market at uh, the Watson Lake Roundabout. So that's kind of obvious. They get a lot of business from people going to the Dells. They probably enjoy the view themselves. They have a sign up at their gas station, which is great. But really surprising things, here's an HVAC uh, uh, wholesale distributor on 6th Street with a Save the Dells sign. I mean, that's awesome. You got the construction industry that's like getting behind this conservation movement. Like, that's just kind of unheard of. Normally, things are really polarized, that it's like, it's, it's the pro-developers and the anti-developers, but we've been real careful to walk that middle line and make it clear that this is about balance and appreciating and protecting places that mean so much to a community. Um, so, hi, Sedona. <laughs> so, I didn't know you'd be here, but has anyone seen one of these postcards? Okay, so these were postcards that, uh, that uh, Sedona created um, and put them at uh, restaurants and shops around town and people could just fill out the back and put a little note and then she would come around and pick them up and bring them to city council. And how many of these did you deliver to city council, you think? Over 800. I, I was gonna guess a couple hundred, but that is, that is awesome. Um, you know, to, to engage uh, our youth in this community, to take this upon themselves, we on Save the Dells Committee had no idea about these postcards. Like, she's, she's just a, she's a maverick. She's, she, like, we just heard through the grapevine. It's like, oh, there's these Save the Dells postcards, you know? But they say, save our Dells. She must have known that we trademarked Save the Dells. So thank you very much for, for doing that. But 800 postcards to city council. That says a lot right there. 
Who saved the Dells? Well, it's a bunch of really awesome ladies. Does anyone here read Prescott Woman Magazine? All right, so you may have seen in the June-July issue, um, these are the Prescott native women that serve on and lead and work for Save the Dells. Uh, Sarah on the left is our volunteer and event coordinator. Shannon helps with events. Amber is in the middle, she's chairman. And then Summer who helps with events and um, writing thank you notes to donors and other things. And Kaolin on the far right is our administrative assistant. But we have an active, engaged youth component in this movement, which in Prescott is unique and exciting to have a bunch of people who are balancing having a, a young family and having to work 60 hours a week and still making time for this. It's really, really encouraging. And then, but ultimately, uh, Save the Dells is you, the people. Did anyone come out to the hike and bike to Save the Dells event? So pretty good, about a third of you uh, really amazing event. About 600 people came out. This is a speech that I gave at, um, uh, at the Point of Rocks, the old train station. But on this event, what we did was we set up uh, 10 stations that were points that Arizona Eco Development would have had a road cross, or from that point, you would have seen 200 houses, or at that point, there would have been um, you know, a, another road. There's going to be three roads. Um, but people trying to make sense of this tremendously disastrous proposal could come out and see it firsthand and stand on the Peavine Trail and say, oh my God, there would be a road right here. The Peavine Trail would be destroyed. And so this was hugely important to uh, galvanize support in the community and make it tangible and real that this is not just some, some, some joke threat. I mean, this is happening. This developer right there, here's the Peavine Trail right there would have been about 15 houses. Fortunately, they've backed off from that aspect of their proposal, thanks to our collective pressure, but uh, we don't have them all the way to where we want them yet. So you've got a good sense of who Save the Dells are. Um, look in the mirror, it's the people. It's every time you speak up or if you cast your vote for Kathy Rusing, or if you write a letter to the editor or to the council, you are Save the Dells. So what are our main goals? We've got a lot, but I really just gotta focus on a couple of them. Um, so right here is a beautiful shot looking south on the Peavine Trail, right about where Arizona Echo Development wants to put a road. In their original proposal, there would have been a house right here. Um, and that's just like a non-starter for a conservation group like us. It's just ridiculous to think about putting a development right there in such a beloved place. So that's our mission is to, is to prevent that from happening. Um, this is the rock formation that's usually called Point of Rocks. And then this is called Easter Peak. And then these in the background are on the Storm Ranch, which is another high priority conservation uh, project. So goal one is the regional park. We could potentially, if we're as successful as possible, create a 7,000 acre regional park, which would include existing protected lands, private lands that we will conserve, city land, state land. Well, I'm gonna skip over this right now, but we're gonna get back to it. Goal two is to protect 500 acres of Arizona Eco Development's uh, 2,500 acre development project, um, which is in the context of their development agreement, they need to protect 25% of their acreage as open space. And so our position is 500 of their 625 or so required acres should be right there to cluster their open space requirement in the place that makes the uh, most sense ecologically, recreationally. This photo is looking into ground zero. Here's the Peavine Trail. Watson Lake is behind this rock over there. Here's what we call No Name Creek with a riparian cottonwood forest. You can see the sandy wash down in the creek down there. Uh, this would be right where a road is. Uh, a, they want to put their resort over here. A road would wrap around and put houses right here. Houses on the other side of this rock, just totally, a totally disgusting proposal. Um, and we've managed to push back on it pretty, pretty well. For context, back here in the distance, that's like the Yavapai Hills uh, neighborhood. The same developer, J Jason Giese, who's the developer behind Arizona Eco Development, also owns this piece of property right here and has a, a several hundred home development approved for there. And that's something we probably will not ever be able to stop. 
So unfortunately, things will change. Uh, developments are happening out there. So let's focus on the regional park, because I think that's really important for us to really be thinking about and understanding in the long term. So we could potentially protect up to 7,000 acres. That would be at the center of uh, what will someday be the interconnected metropolis of Prescott, Prescott Valley, and Chino Valley. These communities are all growing together, and there's virtually nothing we can do to stop that. But this regional park would be at the center and could be the pride and joy of the greater Prescott area. So there's really three geographic components of the regional park. There's the Granite Dells, which, uh, which I think we all know what that is. There's Glassford Hill, which is the big grassy mountain that's between Prescott and Prescott Valley. And then there's this little known uh, piece of geography called Klein Mesa. Klein Mesa is just the southern flank of uh, Glassford Hill. It's a lava flow. Glassford Hill is a volcano. So it's a lava flow that forms a mesa. Um, and it's, it's a substantially large piece of land in itself. And it's quite important. Was this uh, my idea? No. Was it Amber's or Tom's or Roy or other people on the committee? No. Um, was it anyone in this room's idea? Maybe. This idea has actually been, along, been around for a long time. If we go back to the Open Space Master Plan, which was published in 2008, which really represented the culmination of about 10 or 12 years of volunteer work by a number of individuals. Anyone in here work on the Open Space Master Plan? Ashley? Yeah, I think I recall seeing your name on the second page. Yeah, okay. So, um, and, and there we go, the same picture, Granite Dells, Glassford Hill, Klein Mesa. If we look at the Open Space Master Plan, uh, these geographies are all in there. Um, go to section three, areas that deserve consideration for open space preservation, Glassford Hill. Uh, it talks about 2,000 acres of state trust land that are suitable for conservation purposes. So Glassford Hill, Prescott's been talking about protecting that for a long time. The Granite Dells, streams and lakes, that's obvious. I mean, the city's done well in protecting the lakes, although it was not so much for open space purposes or wildlife purposes, it was for, uh, to own the water rights. Um, some streams could still be protected, like Boulder Creek, which runs through the Storm Ranch, or No Name Creek, which runs through AED's land. Uh, Granite Dells, wildlife corridors and geology. You know, we've, from the start, been really pushing this issue of wildlife corridor protection and the fact that the general plan is, uh, speaks many times to the importance of protecting wildlife corridors. And then, still in section three, areas that deserve consideration for open space, Klein Mesa. And I'm actually gonna read this one. South and west of Glassford Hill is the broad butte of Klein Mesa, an important part of the scenic eastern skyline and gateway vista, the city of Prescott. And it's true, when you're on 69 and you look up, uh, look to the south, you're seeing Klein Mesa right there with, uh, with uh, some development climbing up the slopes. It provides grassland habitat for pronghorn, though its value as a wildlife corridor is rapidly being compromised by nearby development, which is ongoing. Sundog Ranch has held a grazing lease from the state land department. Sundog Ranch and Storm Ranch are kind of interchangeably used. But this is a key sentence. Its value as open space would be enhanced if it were protected in conjunction with the Watson Lake Wildlife Corridor and Glassford Hill. So this hits on the key idea that protecting these lands in conjunction with each other creates a bigger, better scenario where they complement each other for wildlife values, uh, for watershed protection, um, for, wild, for recreation, for scenery. So the big picture was there, and Ashley probably wrote that sentence right there. No? Maybe Walt did. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so it, the regional park idea isn't necessarily new. I think we just finally gave it a name, and we said, hey, well, let's stitch all these things to get together and call it a regional park and preserve. So let's focus on this a little bit. Who's seen this map? A good, a good amount of you. It's on our website, savethedells.org. Um, I just want to explain it. Maps, not everyone can read a map well. They're complicated. There's a lot of information here. I tried to make it as simple as possible. I'm a map maker, and I understand maps really well as a cartographer, uh, but not everyone can read a map. So I just want to explain a few things. So um, City of Prescott is right here. You come out 89, go past the VA, come up through a little undeveloped stretch, which is the um, uh, Yavapai Indian Reservation, come past Watson Woods, and then boom, there's Watson Lake, there's Willow Lake. 
Peavine Trail comes up right here and continues north, and the Iron King Trail goes off right there. So this blue lima bean shape is the Granite Dells, the rocks, the valleys, what you know of as the Granite Dells. This right here says Glassford Hill, so that's the top of Glassford Hill. All right, so those are just some landmarks. Look at the colors. This green outline could be the regional park. That's the biggest possible thing. That's the most land it ever could really encompass. We'll never, ever accomplish all of that. It's impossible. But we can do as best as we can. But that is potentially up to 7,000 acres in size. The red is Arizona Echo Development. This is their 866-acre south annexation. Uh, this is where they originally proposed about 2,600 homes on 866 acres. The core of our fight with Arizona Echo Development is this southern portion right here, everything under the blue line. So this is the 500 acres we're trying to protect. The big picture is the regional park. Arizona Echo is this 500 acres. Still, even people on Planning and Zoning Commission, who we've met with multiple times, people in City Hall, who we've met with multiple times, not Kathy, she understands this, People still don't understand that Arizona Echo's 500 acres is not the same thing as a regional park. And we want you to understand that when we succeed and protect the 500 acres, we still are not at our goal. We're like 10% of the way there. We still have a lot more work to do, and we're looking for this to be a multi-generational challenge that the people of Prescott will face. Because after we protect the 500 acres with Arizona Echo, there's the rest of the Storm Ranch right here. There's about 300 acres right there that we need to raise money for to purchase from the landowners. And that's just gonna be a real estate deal. Raise money, buy the land, get it in public ownership. There's land that's owned by old ranch families like um, the Rifle Ranch and the Keekeffer family. We wanna negotiate deals with those families too to buy their land. So there's a lot of real estate involved in this. Land acquisition, raise money. How much money? Someone throw a number out there. How much money do you think we have to raise to put together the regional park? The highest I heard was 20 million. Does anyone want to wager higher bet? Right. Eric's right. My estimate is we need to raise $50 million. And if we raise $50 million, we can do this with some exception because there's some properties in there that are already developed or have approved development plans. But that's what it's gonna take, 50 million. And that's no joke. So other things to look at on this map is, uh, is the green shaded area. That's existing open space. Like here's Willow Lake. This here is the Constellation Trails. This here is the Granite Gardens. This is the Watson Lake Storm Ranch area. And right here is Ecosa. And so there's a lot of protected land out there already, and we should all be grateful for that. There's about 2,000 acres in this whole block that's already protected, but that means there's about 5,000 acres to go. The blue shade is Arizona State Trust land. Pop quiz, can Arizona State Trust land be developed? Right, that's what it's there for. Uh, State trust land exists to fund the land grant colleges of ASU, U of A, and NAU. And the entire uh, existence of the state trust land department is to auction off their land or develop it with uh, minerals or livestock grazing. Uh, so a developer at any point can nominate a piece of state trust land for development. And if they can outbid everyone else, they can get it and then build houses on it. But you don't have to be a developer. You could be the city of Prescott. For example, this property is called Stringfield Ranch. It's outside of the regional park, but it's part of this broader wildlife and recreation corridor that connects the regional park to the Prescott National Forest. This is Stringfield Ranch. A developer named Jeff Davis has a development proposal out with several hundred homes. And the city has nominated a portion of state trust land that the city will buy so that he can annex his land. And so your current city council is supporting the notion of the city spending taxpayer dollars to buy state trust land to facilitate the annexation of private land. Um, I don't know if you should feel good about that or not. Any wager? Uh, yeah, don't feel good about it. 
Um, so that's, that's kind of, that's, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of shady. Um, but anyway, state trust land can be developed almost at any point. And so that's why we're trying to protect all of that. So the last thing I want to point out is this orange right here, this color, you know, I'm going to zoom into the next slide. All right. So, um, this orange color right here is South Storm Ranch. That's an approved development. Um, that development is um, spearheaded by former city councilor Charlie Arnold. And um, that's a real bummer because this is the Peavine Trail right next to Watson Lake. You'll be standing there looking at Watson Lake, counting your raptors, and you'll turn around and there's going to be 300 houses right there. So this is something that we should be very upset about, but there's very little we can do. It's an approved development. They have their water rights. The only reason that they haven't broken ground yet is because it's difficult ground to break, literally. It's a hard site to develop, and so they have had trouble coming up with the financing to put in the infrastructure. So really, what saves a piece of property like that is recession and bankruptcy. So we'll see what the future holds on that front. <laughs> yeah, great news for everyone. Yeah, <laughs> Tom, question? Great point. So, right. So Tom mentioned the 1% sales tax. We could have had the $50 million. $191 million was raised off the sales tax that ran from 2000 to 2015. Roughly half of it should have been used in open space. Instead, only 19 million has been used in open space. So there would have already been $50 million to do this, but it was spent on roads. Um, and still, there, I still hit potholes. Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yes, ma'am. The red area is entirely purchased, 100% owned by Arizona Echo Development, with the exception of the trail corridors that run through it. The city of Prescott owns the Peavine Trail, and the city of Prescott Valley owns the Iron King Trail. But all of what's shaded red is already owned by the developer. Yep. So this is complicated real estate. It's complicated politics because we're dealing with municipal entities and we're, we're going to be dealing with the state. We're going to be dealing with the feds. We're going to be dealing with the county. And so this is where the science of land conservation about minimizing ha habitat fragmentation, I identifying high priority wildlife sites such as the, the lakes and the creeks and the woodlands out there. That's where the science hits the reality that it isn't really good science or good intentions that makes things like this happen. It's politics and real estate. Question. Where is this Klein, Klein Mesa? Yeah. That's my next slide. So I just put, <laughs> I just put Klein Mesa. So you might have been asking, where is Klein Mesa? So here is one of the priorities in the open space master plan is this black outline Klein Mesa. And like I talked about, here's a couple developments. South Storm Ranch. And then there's this one. I still need to change the color on the map. I didn't know what it was until semi-recently, but this is Jason Giese's other development, uh, YHD North, Yavapai Hills Development North. And so already Klein Mesa is um, not looking so good. Uh, opportunity lost there. I would love it if, if we could protect this piece of property still. But basically, I think we'd need probably three to $5 million to buy those people out. Question? Down here? Yes. Yeah. You can have the range. Okay, yep. And that land, not the top portion, but the bottom portion is going down, was just leased by uh, ranchers who run cattle and horses. Yep. In there. But the thing is, we had green hail. Mm hmm. Uh, the western flood has come. We have eight new farms. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, the the chaparral chaparral is an incredible habitat for wildlife. As difficult as it is for us to walk through it, the animals seem to do fine. And uh, but yeah, you're right. Um, the Prescott National Forest and State Land Department did just allow the return of cattle into uh, this area down here, all the way down to Big Bug Mesa. Cattle have not been in there for about ten years, and it's part of a broader uh, west wide. Uh, 
um, movement right now. Cattle numbers are increasing substantially, despite the fact that um, there are a number of uh, data points to indicate that they are having ever greater impact on the environment. But that is not the uh, fight that Save the Dells is, is, is taking on. But just to note, this blue is state trust land, and this brown squiggle is the circle trail. All right, so there's Klein Mesa and two major developments already threatening it. So we're up to some real, we got real challenges with the regional park, no doubt about that. But there's a lot of opportunity there too. Look at that, it's amazing. Perfect place for a regional park and preserve and it's not too late. Pretty much everything in this entire scene, we can still protect in a nearly pristine state. All of that. Right now, of this scene, this is one of the surprising things. When you look at the Granite Dells from that pullout on 89 that looks over the lake, you think, oh, look at that beautiful protected space. No, only like a quarter of it is protected. You're looking at a whole lot of land that is subject to be developed. If a developer wanted to put a road up Glassford Hill and put a casino on the top, they have every right to do so if they can buy the land. And so this is the battle that we are facing in terms of private land and state land protection. All right, one question in the back. It's a very relevant question, and we'll get to that, okay? Yep. And understand we will go over our allotted time because of the technical difficulties. So, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so goal two, Arizona Echo Development. Uh, this is, um, there's a lot you don't hear about Save the Dells because it's very complicated to convey these multifaceted issues to the general public and have it not get... Um, overly complicated. Uh, when you're a person that only has so much time to pay attention to the issues and you're only on Facebook for a half an hour a day or you only read the newspaper for a few minutes or whatever it is, you know, we're doing a heck of a lot of things that we don't tell you because we have to focus on the one key issue, which is Arizona echo development. This is the threat that's in our face. Had we not engaged in this, created Save the Dells and started this fight, this development would have been approved probably six months ago and there would be roads being built right now. So we've slowed the process down substantially and we probably have a long ways to go. Um, so again, this is the hike and bike to Save the Dells event. There's a bunch of people. And then this is looking at uh, Arizona Echo Development and then Storm Ranch back here. The two highest priority parcels of land to protect. So um, you've probably seen this map. Uh, you won't be able to read any of it, so don't squint. Uh, but it's on our website. And I ask that if you are interested in this campaign to find it on our website and really study it. This is complicated stuff to convey. We've tried to make this map as simple as possible. But I'll basically say a few key things. First, let's look at the map on the left. So this one. Here's the 866-acre south annexation. See the orange all over the place? That's all the land that Arizona Echo Development owns, 15,000 acres. They own land from the Granite Dells all the way to Chino Valley. They bought it out of a bankruptcy auction for $2,000 an acre. They stand to make several billion dollars. They're going to make several billion dollars on this real estate. This is, this is the next 20 or 30 years of work for Jason Giese. This is his career. He's going to get super rich. Well, he already is. But so... So the big picture is all we're fighting for is this right here. They have plenty of land to be flexible. We're not trying to stop a mom and pop outfit from developing the ranch because they can't afford to send the kids to school. This is a huge international development corporation led by a guy from London who doesn't live in Prescott. And we're trying to save this beloved piece of property right there. So let's zoom up, follow the black arrow. So again, here is the 866 acre parcel. And the black dotted line is the 500 acres. So this map is on the website. Uh, study it. If you're not a map reader, then study something else. But it's there for you to understand. And you know, we've given this map to folks in City Hall like a dozen times and still they don't 
understand. They still say, well, your 500 acres is just like, uh, you just pulled it out of a hat, you know? What's it really mean? It's like, okay, this is what it means. Granite Dells, Peavine Trail, Wildlife Habitat Corridor. It's that simple, it's on the map. It's, a, it's available for you to read. We gave it to you a year ago. So, um, but still, they think that it's just some, some flashy number that sounds good and it's good for marketing, but that's not the case. So before I move on from the map, I'll take one question on it if there is one. Good, that's how confusing the map is. All right, so a few slides just looking at Arizona Echo Development's land. It's a beautiful piece of land, all right? So this is the view from the Peavine Trail looking west. The cottonwood forest there is Granite Creek. This is where there has been observed yellow-billed cuckoo nesting. I don't know, but observed hanging out. I don't think they've been documented breeding, but maybe they do. Um, there's a really amazing Native American ruin right up here. Um, this is looking across 89 at the Constellation Trails. So if you've hiked the Constellation Trails, you've switched back up this slope right here. And in the far distance is Granite Mountain. Arizona Echo's plan is to put a couple hundred houses in this meadow. It's not a joke. I don't even know how they would fit it, but they're small lots. And this is a wet meadow, seasonally flooded. There's a wetland indicator vegetation. So they're looking at some serious technical and possibly legal constraints with actually building here. But their plan, even in their second round of, uh, so they submitted an original plan. We pushed back on it. They came back with another plan, which was an improvement, but still, a couple hundred houses in this meadow. This is the view standing on the Peavine Trail. So if they got their way, say goodbye to that view. This is a view from the existing city protected open space in Storm Ranch. So last year, the city did purchase 160 acres in Storm Ranch, but only after Jean Wilcox in her, her, her final move in city council uh, went to um, to great efforts and probably others in this room too, to get the city to actually spend some of the open space money in open space rather than spend it all on roads. So this, the city council um, did purchase this land. So the, so the city open space, basically the parcel boundary is right here pretty much. And then the next third of the photo is Storm Ranch. And then everything back here is Arizona Echo Development. All right, this is Point of Rocks. This is Easter Peak. This is where the resort would go. This mesa is where Mike Fan is currently developing a resort or a, a community called um, Granite Dells Estates. This mesa edge right here is the edge of the 500 acres. So basically the area we're talking about is from the border of Storm Ranch up to the edge of this mesa. This is a photo on the Peavine Trail with me and two characters I cannot identify. Um, due to um, privacy concerns, uh, but um, they may or may not work for the city of Prescott. Um, but there we are, kind of at ground zero, right where Arizona Echo's road would cross and houses right there. This is Eagle Peak. Walt Anderson named this, I think, but maybe, um, who's our other great Prescott College birder? Uh, I think Carl Tomoff may have named it. Another birder may know, but that's because golden eagles have nested up there in the past. I don't know if they do right now, but uh, perfect golden eagle nesting habitat. Um, and uh, so this is where the resort would be. And currently, that is what they're still proposing. The Iron King Trail cuts through this beautiful uh, woodland, a diverse species mix of trees, um, and the resort would go right here. Here's another perspective um, looking. Uh, this is someone... Uh, Someone sent us this photo. They trespassed on Arizona Echo's land to get this vantage, but this area would fill up with a 200-room resort. It's 42 duplexes and 15 sixplexes, plus all the things that go along with a resort, like you know, restaurants and parking and um, facilities buildings and tennis courts and all that jazz. Right now, it's a beautiful, wild piece of incredible uh, woodland and forest habitat with the Iron King Trail cutting directly through like that. So we're trying to prevent that. And then here's Point of Rocks with the Peavine National Recreation Trail on the right. That's one of the things that some people don't recognize. This trail is nationally recognized. It's a designated national recreation trail and often voted the most beautiful one in the country. And so we're trying to protect that. 
So these are some sites of Arizona Echoes land that we're trying to protect. These are other sites. This, for some people, this is their connection with the Dells. Why are we so serious about this? Because this is Prescott's economy. We put it on our phone book. We put it on Prescott Living Magazine. It fuels visitor spending. People like our uh, Vice Chair Paula Burr moved here. They chose Prescott because the Dells were so awesome. A lot of people say that. We've had a number of letters to the editor, people saying, I chose Prescott because the hiking here, including the Dells, is world class. So it's not just about the scenery and the recreation and the wildlife. It's an economic decision. And we learned that early on when we realized the only thing that city council would listen to is the economics of this. The fact, is this going to, is this going to pay out? If we save this land, is it going to be good for the economy or bad? And we will argue it is very good for the economy. Uh, especially consider birding. You know, I don't have any statistics. Maybe someone does, but birding generates a tremendous amount of, of tourism and visitor spending. And if we have a 7,000 acre regional park that goes from creek bottom and lake up to this beautiful grassy volcanic mountain, you have this huge ecological gradient that you can go see a variety of species from, you know, from, a, 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 from waterfowl up to grassland birds. And so it's a huge economic uh, engine right there. The, US, the federal government, uh, finally, after years of lobbying from the outdoor industry, calculated what outdoor recreation is worth. Na nationwide, $374 billion. Um, that's a few bucks. So a lot of that comes here in Prescott, although it's not been quantified. Um, this is a, uh, a poll which uh, Colorado College does every year. Uh, it's on a number of different environmental issues, but the question in this one is the importance of outdoor recreation to the economic future of the West. You know, a lot of people, have you, if you've heard the term the new West, you know, we're moving out of a period of gold mining and coal mining and, and logging and all these extractive industries and towards industries that are driven largely by appreciation of nature. And Arizona, 91% of respondents in Arizona believe that outdoor recreation is, is important to the uh, future of our state. Uh, granted, we are below average here, um, but hey, Arizona is below average in a lot of things. So, you know, why, why, not, why not stay consistent? Now, there's very little uh, specific Prescott data, but uh, NAU, Northern Arizona University, did a study uh, in 2015 um, that, uh, where they, they uh, basically spent a bunch of time down in the downtown square and asked people why they're in Prescott. Um, 40.2% of people who surveyed uh, said that while they were here, they used the trails. And so a heck of a lot of people, 40.2% of them, who come to Prescott go use the trails. And so those people are staying in hotels and eating out dinner and going to see a movie and um, going to Jay's Bird Barn and buying $800 binoculars and all sorts of great stuff. <laughs> so... So huge economic uh, value to protecting open space. So this, this is Arizona Echo Development's website. If you haven't been there, I encourage you to do so. It's www.arizonaechodev.com. Has anyone ever heard the term greenwashing? Greenwashing is when you basically uh, say a bunch of lies or half-truths to make you sound to make yourself sound greener and more environmental than you actually are. They had a professional greenwasher write this language, I tell you. Um, so all through their website, it's got all sorts of uh, very beautiful flowery language. We are native Arizonans who aspire to manage the land responsibly with an eye towards the land's heritage and the great natural beauty of the site. All right, let's uh, zoom in to a particular phrase. Whatever we do must be sensitive to the local needs and concerns of the area's citizens. And they go on to say, we will maximize open space, minimize use of limited water resources. So we saw this and we're like, oh, they're inviting us to start Save the Dells. This is great. Uh, they want to hear what the local needs of our concerned citizens are. Well, this is great. Um, turns out when we first met with them, they weren't as happy as I thought they would be. Uh, <laughs> So we saw this as a real invitation to engage in the process, literally. Uh, they probably didn't think when they wrote that that they were going to meet a force as mighty as we have become. But alas, here we are. And I've archived their website. So if they ever change it, I have a record that they said this. 
Here's another invitation. This is a sign which is now gone, but it was on the Iron King Trail where it forks off of the pea vine. If you've been going out there for years, you would have seen this. This is a sign that the city of Prescott put up. Please be aware the trail experience you are enjoying could be affected by future changing land uses. Private lands in this area will be sold and developed. Become informed and involved with your local governments and organizations. Yeah, well, I wonder if the, if, uh, the mayor and the folks on council are, are glad they approved that message at this point, because I think we've been a real, we've really irritated them, unfortunately. Um, but another invitation. So Save the Dells, um, we feel pretty good about engaging the way we have, because we were invited to do so. I have it in writing. So to answer the question, why are we a political action committee? It's not just so we can make really cool red, white, and blue banners. Although as much as I don't like 4th of July, I do like red, white, and blue. Um, why are we a PAC? First, let's look at this. We're going to get a little academic here. So um, someone with Natural Resources Defense Council, or NRDC, presented this at a conference I was at a couple years ago. It was her top 10 tips for effective advocacy. And I brought this to a Save the Dells meeting like the next week. And I was like, guys, guys, this is it. This is how we're going to win. And everyone was really riled up. And even at a, a recent meeting a couple months ago, I brought it back out and said, this is, let's just check ourselves, all right? But someone at Natural Resource Defense Council, one of the nation's foremost environmental groups, they determined this is how you win. Pick your fight wisely. I think we've done that. Identify your time frame and timeline. It's now. Urgent. But these next three really, really are the key of why we're a PAC. Identify the decision makers. It's city council. Determine who influences them. We're hoping that that's all of you when you elect a Save the Dells in, a candidate who has endorsed Save the Dells official position. De de determine what influences decision makers. Well, often it's money but we're hoping it will be the people, if the people take a stand, stand up, and speak, and speak intelligently and passionately. Uh, and then the rest of them are good, too. Identify your allies, you know, Audubon Society, Central Arizona Land Trust, um, other organizations around town. Get your facts straight. We've tried very hard to be truthful and to, and to deflect the incredible amount of untrue stuff that's said about us. Uh, if you ever listen to the radio station called KYCA, um, it's, I, I think KYCA could be a great thing for this community, but it is a fire hose of untrue statements. Um, find the money. If you've donated, thank you very much. We're approximately one ten thousandth of a way towards our $50 million goal. <laughs> um, use the media. We've been very effective in that, both intentionally through our, our engagement with the media, but also sowing a grassroots utilization of the media through all of the letters to the editor that people have been writing. And lastly, find a lawyer. Um, we have an excellent lawyer on our committee who happens to have once been uh, very involved uh, with the city of Prescott. He, may, he or she may or may not have been the city attorney at one time. So we have very good insights into um, municipal planning and land use law and city processes. So uh, hats off to our, to our attorney who is on the... Um, on our committee. So, but to answer the question, why are we a PAC? Who's the decision maker? It's the city. We had to realize that we had to engage with the city and we realized that right away. So basically I'm gonna propose five ideas of why we're a PAC. And the reason I'm going into this is because some people still, even though we've been very forthright with the fact that we're not a 501c3, we're a political action committee, some people still didn't really understand or didn't take the time to understand and were shocked when we came out and supported a city council candidate. Maybe some of you in here today were shocked, and that's fine. I hope that you will understand after I present these five points why we had to do that. One, fact. Arizona Echo Development, AED, they want to annex into the city of Prescott. Fact. City councilors vote on annexations. Fact. In the spring of 2019, Recently, we still only had one person on city council who we thought would vote on our side. Fact, B 
Because of that, we needed more counselors on our side. And lastly, fact, a PAC can endorse and support a candidate, a 501c3 can't. And we saw this coming three years ago. We knew that ultimately we were gonna have to engage in the political process and shape city council and ma'am in the back who asked the question, I'm answering your question now. We realized we had to engage in politics and it was not easy. There was a lot of head scratching and heart wrenching uh, decisions that we had to make, but um, you know, we did it. So where did that, where did that lead us? Okay. A PAC can endorse and support a candidate. Well, that's exactly what we did. Ta -da! <laughs> so did anyone get this in the mail? That's good to hear. That means they actually sent them. All right. So we sent 20,000 of these out. Every address in Prescott, plus some in Yavapai County because we couldn't control the postal routes, got these. We actually sent more than 20,000 of these. This was our mailer. Uh, we endorsed Kathy Rusing for city council. Kathy is the only, here we can flip to the back. There's three things that we wrote right here, and these weren't jokes. She's the only candidate that endorsed our position. Kathy was straight up, I support Save the Dells, and on council, I will fight for the outcome you're trying to achieve. Two, she's the only candidate to complete our simple questionnaire. We sent all the candidates a 20 question questionnaire. They were tough questions, but hey, if you're a public figure, you gotta answer tough questions, right? I'd hope so. She's the only one that answered them. In fact, two of the candidates urged the third candidate not to do it. So they, they co-conspired to not answer the questions. And third, credibility. The only candidate who wouldn't accept developer money. In fact, a developer made a contribution and Kathy gave it back. So, um, and in contrast, I think somewhere uh, the uh, Billy Orr um, took in around $15,000 or so from developers. Um, so we have faith, we still have faith that Kathy on city council is going to uh, make decisions and ask the questions that will ultimately help save the Dells and help the people of Prescott achieve the outcome we want, not only with Arizona Echo Development's annexation, but stepwise with every step along the way towards a regional park. You know, when the city has a decision to make that, and, I, and you're on the spot here, but when the city has a decision to make, we feel good that you will have our collective interest in mind because the voters spoke up resoundingly, we'll get to that, resoundingly in support of Kathy Rusing, right? <laughs> Yes, in fact, from the Daily Courier, outdistancing her nearest competitor by more than 3,000 votes, she termed her win a mandate from the voters. Yep, thank you, Kathy. And so Kathy received uh, over 11,000 votes out of the 15,000 cast. The final numbers, I think, were different than that, but this was about right. So I did the math very complicated. I had to get my Texas Instruments graphing calculator out. I divided one number by the other and I got 73%. So 73 roughly percent of votes cast went to Kathy Rusing. All right. So thank you if you did that. Um, now, there were accusations by others in city government that the voters were duped or that people didn't understand or that People are just stupid because they didn't vote for the right person. Well, we don't believe any of that. And here's, here's another random sampling. Oh, sorry. I forgot. <laughs> I, I, sorry. I, I, I forgot I put that in there. How could I have? Yeah. So um, the, the current uh, council members were a wee bit surprised as the election results rolled in. But you shouldn't be surprised that a developer is sitting right there next to him. So, <laughs> um, I'm also sitting, look at Steve Blair's shirt. I mean, it's, it's Harley's, it's American flags, it's Mount Rushmore, and, and like everything's like on fire too, you know? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I know, you probably can't read this because the text is small, but here's another data point. You know, every Sunday in the Daily Courier, uh, they publish what's called the rants and raves, all right? Okay. It, it's like Twitter with paper. And um, so the Sunday after the election, there were four rants and raves. Well, 
that were relevant to the election. So the first one, an organized undervoting campaign had the unintended consequence of requiring another election to finish electing three candidates. How much is their ego trip going to cost the taxpayers? All right. So I would interpret that as being anti-save the Dells sentiment. Okay. The next three were pro-save the Dells sentiment. City council, your constituents are speaking to you. Start listening. Wonder if the mayor and city council got the message from the election results. Maybe it's time to clear the local swamp. As long as it's not the swamp at the beginning of the presentation. I like that one. <laughs> Interesting that a council person said he was disappointed to see a special interest group with so much money sway the election. How does he think the mayor got in? It wasn't the money. It's too many big developments. So I would characterize those as as pro save the Dells. Okay, so remember our Texas Instruments graphing calculator math exercise. She got roughly 75% of the vote. Well, that's roughly 75% of public sentiment suggesting that they agree with the outcome and the voters were not duped. So I feel pretty comfortable saying 75% of the engaged electorate in Prescott is pro save the Dells, or if not entirely pro save the Dells, is uh, supportive of other aspects of Kathy's campaign, which are connected, like water policy, like growth, like the never-ending traffic, all right? So these are all issues that play into broader community planning and open space conservation. So we have pretty much built a pretty powerful voting block in Prescott that we are going to have to continue to grow and mobilize over the coming years, like in two years when we have another city council election and elect another mayor. Um, this is, I think this is a pivotal point in Prescott where there is a significant majority that is deeply concerned about the future of this community. And we're looking for a significant change. And you are among that group. So feel good about being in the majority in Prescott. Right, not yet. Yeah, but... No, actually not. Um, there's a uh, voter uh, passed proposition from uh, about uh, 10 or 15 years ago, Proposition 400, which requires that, or it mandates that large annexations like this need a supermajority to pass council. And so, in fact, we only need two councilors to either turn it down or to approve it if it ends up being a good deal. And so, um, we are comfortable saying that uh, with Kathy on council as of November 19th and with another counselor, do you think it's okay to say their name? No? Okay. Another, another city council, sitting counselor, a, a, a sympathetic counselor um, that we have the votes we need. So we're in really good shape. I mean, our, our political experiment here um, got us to where we need to be. We have the votes we need on city council to get the outcome we want man with the hat. Okay, good question. Let's get to that in a minute. Other question? No, it's too late for a write-in. Yeah. All right, so, um, oh, we're already at your question. Yeah, all right, so, so, uh, so what's next and what about you? Because you need to continue to be engaged. So Kathy is going to be sitting on councils of November 19th. Nothing is happening with this, with this development until after then. I mean, they are stalled. The brakes are put on. Um, now it's Lamerson versus Shiska. Um, as an open space advocate uh, and speaking for those on Save the Dells, uh, we have a very hard time supporting either of those. Lamerson has a very bad track record of saying things that are, uh, that, that are contrary to the objectives of open space advocates. Um, Steve, Steve Siska, um, <clears throat> similarly in his time in office, has not been a huge advocate. <clears throat> so um, we have been clear, we are not offering any more endorsements as we did with, Cassie, with, with Kathy. So we are not offering another endorsement. Now, Lamerson actually um, 
requested to meet with us and he tried to win us over. We met with him last week. Um, and, uh, he asked for, uh, an endorsement. He asked if we would um, do similarly with Kathy and spend some money. And we said, no, we're not going to do that. You, you blew it years ago. Um, uh, but this is what we will do. And I'll be straight up. If either of these characters says something in the media or on KYCA or in other venues that, that uh, we think you should hear, we're going to share it with you via our Facebook and our e-newsletter. And hopefully you all get our newsletter. Um, we're going to amplify whatever message they put out there. Oh, I have some, Eric. Thank you. So whatever they say, good, bad, or otherwise, we're going to get it out there. We're not going to endorse either one of these characters, but if Jim Lamerson, uh, had an ad on KYCA that said something pro save the Dells, does, is it up there? All right. Jim Lamerson has an ad on KYCA saying he supports save the Dells official position. So I'm telling you that. So um, does that mean? Well, that's a very good question. And that's why we're not going to offer an endorsement, because um, we collectively don't feel like we can have uh, the level of trust that we have with Kathy. Um, but uh, what we want to offer you tonight is um, uh, an assurance that whoever says something that we think you need to know, we will do our best to get it to you so you can be informed in your vote. Because it is very important. One of these two people will be on city council still. And so um, hopefully both of them are thinking about the results of the election and what it means. Uh, Jim Lamerson was clear to us. Uh, he said, hey, I got the, I got the message. The people spoke. I know what the people said. I heard them, and and I want to be your guy. And we said, well, that's really nice to hear. We still can't endorse you, um, but just but just yeah. He, Jim actually, Jim Lamerson was he filled out the candidate survey, and Amber and I were on our way to get it, and he called and said he wouldn't give it to us. And I thought that was a really sour thing until we recently learned that it was. Uh, two of the other candidates who, who strongly urged him not to give it to us because it would make them look bad. And so there was an organized effort to, um, to, uh, to, control, to, to control Lamerson there. So that's all I really want to say about it. Um, pay, pay attention and, uh, you know, uh, ask your tarot cards, whatever you do. Um, yeah. Okay. A few more little updates there, and then we're done. Um, Last Friday, the state parts director was here in, in Prescott. Surprisingly, because Steve Blair arranged for him to be here. And so the idea is state parks would sweep in with all their millions of dollars that the state doesn't have and buy up Arizona Echo Development's land and uh, solve the problem. Well, the state doesn't really have that much money. Regardless, um, we're happy that the state parks was here. The state is going to be a critical partner in the regional park, and we will continue to engage with the state and keep you informed whenever important things happen. Arizona Echo is stalled maybe for a long time. Um, they, they too saw the results of the election and they too know that their uh, proposal, development proposal, will not pass as it stands. So I would not be surprised if they decided to focus on other projects for five years and wait for um, us to just grow weary and give up. Um, so. That's going to be a challenge for us as an organization. How do we maintain your interest? Um, how do we ensure that we are um, responsibly using the donations that are coming in if this main goal is still years in the, in the future? So um, we're still trying to figure out what that is. And um, the developer has indicated at this point that he has no interest in meeting with us until after the general election. So we won't be meeting with him until November or December. It's possible that Arizona Echo will say, well, I can't get annexed into Prescott. I'm going to go to Prescott Valley or do the development in Yavapai County. We don't believe that's economically feasible based on all of our calculations one way or another. Uh, however, if they decide to go there, uh, we'll go there too and we'll take you with us. And we can show up in mass at Prescott Valley or at the Yavapai County Board of Supervisors. 
if they try to come in through the back door, we'll be there to make sure that they can't. Although I, d I don't think either of those scenarios are likely. <laughs> At some point, they will start planning and zoning commission review. Six months ago, we were saying, it's next week. And here we are six months later, and now I'm saying, it's not even going to be in 2019. Um, if in 2020, who knows? I mean, we don't know what they're doing. Uh, they don't see a pathway to get their development approved, and so it's hard to say what they're going to do. But the next step is for them to go to P and Z, and we will let you know via our emails and Facebook what's going on there. Um, now, someone asked about city water policy. Oh, there was Roy Smith. Okay, so here's, here's the, the, the super Cliff Notes version. Uh, the city wants to make uh, city water available to county properties outside of city limits. Um, there are reasons they are proposing to do this, one of them being so they can get those houses on sewer and that water can go into recharge, which benefits the aquifer. Uh, and then there are the other unsaid reasons like, oh, 99% of the land that would be served by the expanded area is either Deep Well Ranch or Arizona Echo Development. And so it seems like it's kind of, it's a backdoor way. Arizona Echo can get their water without annexing, all right? So that's, that could be uh, part of the deal. So um, the group, Save the Dells is not the leader on the water issue. CWAG, I hope you've heard of CWAG, the Citizens Water Advocacy Group. Now is a great time to become a member and engage in CWAG because this water policy will be a defining point for Prescott for years to come. And with Kathy on council, it's going to be uh, very helpful because Kathy has a very realistic view about water and understands that it is a very finite resource in this area. Uh, so please uh, engage with CWAG if you can. And then if AED is really stalled and we realize that that fight might be five years out, you know, who knows? They've got other projects. We need to move on to figuring out how we acquire Storm Ranch. We're going to have to raise a few million dollars. Um, there, we have a sister organization, the Granite Dells Preservation Foundation, granitedells.org. They are a 501c3, and you can expect this fall for us to work together on an end-of-year big fundraising campaign. Our goal will be to raise about $50,000 by the end of the year to start a fund at the Arizona Charitable Foundation. So um, stay tuned for hearing more about that. Um, but we really need to take seriously Storm Ranch because the current owners are very, very old. Um, they make this room look very young. And, um, <laughs> and uh, they're, uh, the, the people who come after them may not be so interested in selling to a conservation cause, which these, the current owners are. Question? Yeah, so the Storm Ranch was about 480 acres. The city bought 160, leaving about, what's the, 320 as a balance. And so, um, so the ranch family lives out there. Our vision is we will carve out a block of land around their property that will give them privacy, and they will continue to live there, and that land will just pass down through the generations, 20 acres or so. And, but the bulk of the 300 acres around it, we would acquire and add to the city's open space portfolio. Yep. Okay. Well, Eric says no, but um, let, let's do an informal poll. Uh, raise your hand real high so it's easy to see if you would be willing to pay another 100 bucks a year in an open space sales tax. Yeah, so, no? Yeah, okay, it's tough. Maybe. Um, yeah, so, um, so maybe. It's possible. It's, some, it's something we're considering, all right? So um, I'll just, this is the last slide. These are some upcoming events. Um, if you're not on our news, if you don't get our newsletter, just go to savethedells.org, and you can sign up there, and we send about one email a week, or follow us on Facebook if you do that. But basically, fall for the Dells week, the whole week of October 12 through 19, we're doing a series of, of events um, where you can uh, come get a t-shirt and some stickers and talk to us and see the maps and ask questions, ride bikes out on the Peavine Trail, 
Um, this thing got canceled because that bar, Rickety Cricket, is disorganized and double booked it. And, um, and, uh, and then stay tuned November 14th for a big event, Rocks from the Rocks to the River, where we're going to be talking about the bioregional initiative of protecting the Granite Dells and the Verde River and how and why they are connected ecologically and culturally in our collective psyche. So um, I feel like I've answered a lot of questions along the way. Maybe we don't need to take questions at the end. We had some delays in the beginning. Um, I very much appreciate your attention and the good questions. And um, shoot us questions at Save the Dells at Gmail and sign up for email, et cetera. And um, see you at some events. Thank you very much. Thank you for a fantastic meeting. Uh, that was just an amazing presentation. I hope all of you enjoyed it. We apologize for the technical difficulties we had at the beginning, but thank you for being patient with us. I have a few presentations I'd like to make. Um, each month when we have our monthly membership meetings, we have a bird feeder in the back that we call Feed the Feeder, where we allow people to put money in the feeders and we use that money to buy bird seed to donate to care centers. Well, tonight our Feed the Feeder is going to be for Save the Dells. So please put donations into the Feed the Feeder tonight, okay, on your way out, and let's support the cause of the Dells. Also, the check, the honorarium that would normally go to the speaker is going to Save the Dells, sorry. <laughs> so I got a check for Save the Dells. In appreciation for the presentation tonight, we'd like to present to Joe this beautiful plaque. Thank you very much. and a patch for the Prescott Audubon Society, and, and a microfiber lens cleaning cloth for your $800 binoculars. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> we apologize, we really don't have time for uh, questions here tonight because of this meeting's gone long, but Joe's accessible, and please feel free to visit with him afterwards, and I encourage you to get involved. Thank you very much for coming tonight.